What's going on everyone? My name is Prerag Juthani. I'm an MD MBA student here at Yale and today I'm going to be talking to you about step one is going pass fail. So what should we do next? This is obviously a huge change and step one is going pass fail starting at the end of January. And so because of that, it's going to cause a huge change in the things that we're going to expect in the coming months. And so because of that, let's just openly talk about it. These changes are going to be vast, but before I begin, I want to tell you a bit about the source of this video. It's based on an article that was written by the AAMC, well not the AAMC, someone who wrote an article that was posted on the AAMC website, uh, Dr. Uh, Catherine uh, Crichton, and you can see that a lot of what I'm going to tell you is reiterated in this article, which I'm going to link in the description below. Before we begin, it's also important to remember that step one is going pass-fail on January 26th. After January 26th, step one be will become a pass-fail exam. Before January 26th, step one will still be um, the classic um, classic exam that everyone has grown to know and love or maybe hate and it's the one that's out of 300 and you know 250 is a great score all that stuff is going to apply the other part about this that's important is because of this change it's important to know where we're coming from before this change step one was one of the biggest contributors to the residency process but now that it's pass fail things are going to change if you actually also think about this step one was also taken in between your preclinical year. So in medical school, you have preclinical, which is when you are studying in the classroom, learning the basic pathology, pathophysiology of all the diseases. And then there's the clinical year, which is when you're in the hospital. Preclinical is usually between 1.5 to 2 years. And then your clinical year is one whole year. Usually you take your step one in between your preclinical year and your clinical year. And for that reason, you usually have your step one score by the time you apply to residency. As you also know that there's also a step two, step two CK, before, most people would take Step 2 CK in their fourth year of medical school. And guess what you also do during your fourth year of medical school? Apply to residency. So most people applying to residency would not have their Step 2 CK scores um, quite solidified, but most people would have their Step 1 scores. So for that reason, in the past, Step 1 used to be the high-stake exam because everyone would have taken it and you're compared against everyone. And whereas Step 2 CK, a lot of program directors kind of like nudged on because they're like, whatever. But I personally think now that step one is going past fail, everyone is going to try to get step two done before residency. And I think programs are going to prefer it that way. So that way they at least have one score to standardize against. And so moving forward, this is already one thing you should take away. The fact that step two CK, you will probably have to take a bit earlier in your fourth year and definitely before you apply to residency. I personally think. Again, hypothesis, but I, it might be true. We'll see. So the other thing is, is step two CK the second exam I was talking to you about, is that going to be the future now? Most people thought because step one is going past fail, step two CK is going to become the more important exam. Well, I can tell you that that is likely true because look at this. Then in 2018, you can see that this is actually uh, program directors who were surveyed across all specialties. And there was 1,333. This is 2018. This is 2021. And you can see that about 80% of program directors listed the step two CK score as an important factor when you're selecting applicants to interview. This is in 2021, just this past year, and you can see that 93.7% of program directors listed step two as an important factor. Guess what was number one? It was uh, step one, right? Step one and step one. Step one is now gone. It's not a score anymore. It's just a pass or a fail. And so with that out of the way, step two CK is now the second most important thing. You likely clicked on this video because if you looked at the title, I said, now what? So let me now focus on that second part, which is now what? What else is going to matter? Again, this is taken from the article, but I heavily agree with a lot of this stuff. The exam score will definitely matter, but the one thing I've realized is that the score is usually just one thing that gets your foot in the door. What, what I have seen in my interviews this year, which I'm going to talk a ton about moving forward in my channel is that more more than more likely than not people care so much more than scores when it comes to coming into residency people care so much about what is your passion and how have you separated yourself from the pack so one thing that the article brought out was authentically develop your interests i actually published a video earlier it's called how to develop your x factor in school and i think this is kind of what interviews are getting at what makes you different? What makes you unique? What allows you to stand out? And what is something that you think is going to be what you're going to do moving forward, right? There are so many people who can publish 80 papers in medical school. Well, there are not a lot of people, but there are a lot of people that think publishing 80 papers in medical school is the way to go. If you're going to be the research powerhouse, by all means, you can do that. But you don't have to. A lot of people 
can just do some research, figure out if it's for you. But once you find your X factor, really develop that. The second thing that was really emphasized in this article was this aspect of crafting your story. It's really important to do activities and it's important to figure out what's imp- like what's great for you and what is your vibe, but it's even more important to figure out what your story is. And even if you think you did a bunch of disjointed activities and you have no idea what your story is, you still have one. And the more you think about what it is, the more you think about the resounding themes, the better it will be. So for example, for me, I was like, okay, well, I have a YouTube channel. I do a little bit of like research. Um, I did an MBA. I kind of sometimes do business stuff. But like to me, I was like, what the hell? This is all so like sporadic. I have no idea how I tell a story with this. But when I really thought about it, the hallmark of all of that together was this aspect of innovation and always kind of thinking critically and pushing myself a little further and making myself feel a little uncomfortable um, from what a traditional medical student should be. And that I realized was my story. So when I went to residency programs, I said, hey, I'm not a traditional resident. I don't think I am. I don't check those boxes. I have realized that my niche is actually this new niche of healthcare administration, um, this ability to understand the business of healthcare and try to make myself a more competent leader in that realm. And they actually really respected that. They were like, oh, that kind of aligns with all of your interests. And you told this beautiful story. And I was like, well, you know, like you, you just have to think about it. Uh, you can see this quote, you can see in this quote that the author reviewed, um, with the student, the various extracurriculars that the student was doing. And even though the student had a lot of different domains and interests, together they worked and they realized that this student was an innovator. Kind of sounded a little kind of like my story. But all that to say, put your activities out there, figure out the uh, uh, like resounding theme behind them and try to use that to tell your story. Because I think that is going to be definitely way more important moving forward. Um, and then the other thing is advice for students in a post-step one world. You know, Don't play the game too hard. That's like my personal belief. Um, And this is something that I think when I came into medical school, I used to think like, okay, time to play the game again. I'm going to get the best scores. I'm going to be the best person. I'm going to objectively just try to be the best in all of these objective domains. And the one thing I realized is I was playing the game too hard and that actually prevented me from realizing what my true interests were. I was trying to do so well on every single damn exam that I like almost prevented myself from exploring what I really was that brought me joy. And in my latter two, three, four years of medical school, I realized like, hey, I do like studying um, business a little bit more. Hey, I do like doing clinical research more than I like doing basic science research. Hey, I do love exercising way, way more than I thought I did. I need to make a priority for it. So breathe. While it is important to do a lot of those basic things, like get a decent score, if you don't get a 270, you don't get a 250, it's going to be fine because if there are other things that bring you joy and you've realized that you want to prioritize that, you definitely should and you're going to be a better doctor in the long run for it. I personally think. I'm not there yet, but it's just some of the realizations I've made over the last few years. With that being said, I hope you all enjoyed this video. If you did, drop a like, comment, share, subscribe, and I'll see you all in the next one. Thanks for watching. Peace.